Gatwick, the busiest single runway airport in the world. 25,000 staff, 120,000 bags a day, 33 million passengers a year. Put your bag on first, put the first one on, that would be good. In the past, Gatwick struggled to cope with all the things that can go wrong and do go wrong. Operating an international airport is an unpredictable business. You know, you've got to be on your guard and prepared at all times. But now, Gatwick's under new ownership and undergoing a £1 billion facelift. The aim? To create the best airport in the world. We need to be driving this airport to 45 million passengers uh, off the single runway. Flight control. Check. With new management comes tough talk. We've got to change our business now. We want to remove those failures. There's no accountability, there's no leadership, there's no direction. We don't have time to wait. Put up or shut up. Over the last year, we've been there capturing the highs and the lows as the world's busiest single runway airport gets even busier. Ambulance crew on right, please move to one side. I need to move you around so you're going down this way for us, please. Conflicting views as to where we're supposed to go, huge queues, nowhere to sit now. Fundamentally, something's wrong. It failed, it's the second time it's failed in a week. You're responsible, yeah. Coming up, the daily battle to beat delays. Try to shove it onto someone else, like the caterers or the refuelers. Getting passengers to their destinations in one piece. We've been told the patient's unconscious, unresponsive. The unseen workers who keep Gatwick moving. The co-pilot thinks he's seen a crack above the window on the skin. And Gatwick battles to turn around his reputation. God, I hate Gatwick. A windowless netherworld, hideous artificial light and endless dim. On a typical day, over 800 planes carrying over 60,000 passengers land or take off at Gatwick. Like a small city with a population that ebbs and flows. Passengers and pilots. Cleaners and cabin crew. Security staff and baggage handlers. Driving a workout most days. Everyone must come together to make the airport work. <laughs> Gatwick's biggest enemy are delays, which cost the airport millions and create unhappy passengers. All day long it has been wait, wait, wait. Captured over a year, this is a snapshot of a day in the life of Gatwick. There you go, thank you. As its staff rise to the challenge of getting planes and passengers away on time. Bless him. Hope he gets it. It's a day that begins with the morning rush. London, good morning. Shuttle 2903, Captain Mark Gregg and senior flight officer Nicky Woodage are heading to Gatwick on the British Airways morning shuttle service from Manchester. Air hostess Kat Belmont has just a 20-minute window to serve all of her passengers' breakfast. This is 40-minute flight. Thank you very much, sir. And you can have up to 147 people to serve. Today, I think we've got 108, so it's still quite a lot to pack in. Cabin crew, 10 minutes for landing. 10 minutes, thank you. Today, this Boeing 737, known as Oscar Charlie November, will fly 4,000 miles and carry 1,000 passengers on eight separate journeys. Mornings are when Gatwick's runway is at its busiest. This is when most passengers want to depart or arrive. Five, While Oscar Charlie November makes its final approach, air traffic controllers meticulously manage the stream of flights in and out of Gatwick. 30. 2-2-5. Even the smallest of delays can have a knock-on effect over the course of the day. 
While air traffic controllers carefully orchestrate the flow of planes, Gatwick's head of projects, John Briley, is patrolling the South Terminal to keep an eye on something equally important, the flow of passengers. What we have here is actually the first wave of passengers because all in all today we'll probably have about between 60 and 65,000 passengers flying through both terminals, of which probably 25,000 will be in the first four hours. Under new ownership, Gatwick has declared a war on queues, but at peak times, they're unavoidable. Nobody likes to queue, but we want to try and keep queues to an absolute minimum. It's one of our priorities. Now, that first wave of departures, their on-time performance is usually pretty good. But if we don't get it right, then it's like a domino effect, and it will, it will sort of have an impact on the second and maybe the third wave of departures because the aircraft don't have enough time to get out and come back again. What's your flight number? Uh, Z. ZB, right, that's fantastic. Then you don't have to join that queue, my friend. Because they'd only got hand luggage, they didn't have to queue up anyway. They just had to go straight to the fast bag drop. So they're like dogs with two tails, don't know which one to wag. In the past, Gatwick was severely criticised in the press. God, I hate Gatwick. If you want a picture of misery in life, you couldn't do much better than the South Terminal's departure lounge on an August weekend. A windowless netherworld crammed with hard sell shops, overpriced fast food, hideous artificial light and endless din. To address this kind of negative passenger perception, Gatwick's new owners are investing almost a billion pounds on rebuilding the airport. Hi Alan, it's Wayne Lonsdale here. Uh, from Gatwick. How are you doing? Wayne Lonsdale is head of construction in the North Terminal. He's supervised almost £50 million worth of building projects, such as the North Terminal extension and a brand new multi-storey car park. Over the last year, he's battled to make sure the builders do their job without creating an obstacle course for passengers. Today, he's come across a serious breach of health and safety. The contract is vacated and they left it in a, a very bad mess. And as you can see, it's a gate room. And at four and five in the morning, this is full of passengers. It's still got sharps down there and things like that. If somebody's little kid decides to catch, jump over that barrier or anything, then there'll be little nails and things around there. So we've got to stay on the case all the time. This is a climbing frame for a four-year-old. Not only is it unsafe, but also it doesn't represent Gatwick in the high way that it should be. You know, this is not the new Gatwick. Uh, if I was a passenger here, I'd think that we were not such a good airport as uh, our competitors. Tried your 24 hour contact number, and there's no reply on that one. It's not much cop, really, is it? If uh, we're a 24 hour contact line and nobody's there. Hello? It's 9 a.m and Wayne and his colleague have to leave the site in the hope that the builders will have it cleared up by the following morning. Meanwhile, after flying in from Manchester, Oscar Charlie November has arrived on stand. Goodbye, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. You on time, happy passengers, great crew to work with. What more can you ask for, really? The 737's due to head back in just 45 you, minutes. Hi. Busy turnaround, as always. So time is of the essence. In the airline business, every second counts, and British Airways estimate that a minute's delay on a 737 can cost the company over £200. Time is money with aircraft. They're only earning money when they're in the air, so uh, the aim is to fly the aircraft as much as possible. After its second return trip to Manchester of the morning, Oscar Charlie November will then fly to Romanbag before spending the night in Bologna. 25 minutes, we're just going to start boarding now. In charge of keeping it on schedule at Gatwick is turnaround manager Chris Walker. This is why I'm so thin. Up and down stairs all day. He has to check that everything and everyone is in place for a punctual departure. And they're loading down there, as you can see. I've only got ten minutes, so I'm going to whack them up, whack them up a bit quick. I've actually had a suitcase open up once and there's a, a tractor engine in it. One element more than any other in the turnaround process is likely to cause a delay. Famous last words, but uh, passions are always late. And today is no exception. With just minutes before departure, Chris has one that's gone missing. Go and help them. Okay. 
no bags involved, so... If this plane is delayed, it will upset its schedule for the rest of the day. Chris makes a decision that's every passenger's worst nightmare. We're going to go without him, mate. There's another flight later. As I say, up and down, up and down all day. OK, so we're going to come push back. Uh, back to Oscar Charlie November is pushed back and heads off to Manchester on time. But the plane still has five more flights to complete before the day is up. There are no queues. We got them all out of the way for you. I knew you were coming. It's 10 a.m. And in Gatwick South Terminal, the morning rush is over. This is the lull. And these people usually, you can tell by the demeanour, they're relaxing, they're not hurrying. Head of projects, John Briley, has been brought in to scrutinise every aspect of what new managers call the passenger experience. Creating efficiencies wherever possible. Where are you going to, sir? Uh, Heraklion. Heraklion? That's North Terminal, sir. On average, over 400 passengers miss their flights every day at Gatwick. The airport's new owners have invested £2 million to help make it easier for people to find their way around the terminals. I had this lovely lady, very nice lady, and she said, your airport is She said, you want to get your system sorted out, I've been sent from pillar to post. I can't work out where my flight's going from. She said, well, where do I go to check in? I looked at the boarding card. I said, Stanston. For many passengers, flying can be hugely stressful. We've got a report of a 68-year-old female who's unwell. Gatwick paramedic Chris Neal is on his way to the North Terminal, where a passenger has collapsed. At the moment, uh, we've been told the patient's uh, unconscious, unresponsive, but is breathing. We get a lot of collapses. Excuse me, please. And a fair few of them are, are just faints, because people perhaps have left very early in the morning from home, and they haven't yet had breakfast. They've been travelling perhaps two, three hours, and then they're standing in the queue for another two, three hours, and they just get dehydrated. Okay. Hello there. How are you feeling at the moment? Not bad. Yeah? Long. Just one period of unconsciousness? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Long journey? Yeah. And can you see me all right? <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> There's not five of me, that's what I mean. <laughs> Brilliant, OK. She appears to have made a good recovery. And um, they're going to help her through with a wheelchair and hopefully get on our flight off home to Jamaica. This year, Gatwick's 24-hour paramedic team responded to over 2,000 call-outs. Ten were fatal. A lot of heart attacks because people were rushing about. Perhaps they're lifting heavy bags, etc. Gatwick Airport is probably, if you're going to have a heart attack, is the best place to have it. It's got the highest survivable rate in the country because there's so many trained staff You've got a high percentage of nurses and doctors travelling as well. Chris is on a call-out to an elderly passenger who has collapsed on a flight that was just about to take off. The aircraft's still got its anti-collision lights on, which means uh, it's not safe to approach yet. Although the plane and its crew are under constant time pressure, a medical emergency always results in a return to the airport, irrespective of a delay. The captain probably won't be happy to uh, continue the flight with the patient on board. Because the passenger is slipping in and out of consciousness, Chris has asked for an ambulance to attend. He boards the plane to assess the patient. It looks like the gentleman suffered from a, a faint. Uh, he's got up and off his chair a couple of times, feeling dizzy, and then actually went unconscious. Uh, he was lying on the floor when I initially arrived, but conscious. He's just been put on the ambulance to be taken up to the local hospital just for a, a check-up. It was a funny little incident as we were talking to him, because as his oxygen mask was taken off, he asked his wife whether she was going to come with him to the hospital or not, so that caused a bit of a laugh in the back of the aircraft. But uh, So that was a good sign anyway. <laughs> Take care. 
the flight was delayed by half an hour. Yeah, good morning. Scatwick Solo here. I'm all clear at stand 141 and so back available. Over. It's not just the passengers who need tender loving care. So too do the aircraft. Our Kingston flight's coming in. Um, it's Mike Mike Bravo. And then all our services will uh, be on it like a rash. Once we get the passengers off, everyone's on board, get it serviceable and kick it back out. It's 10.30 a.m. and the Gatwick turnaround crew have just an hour left to prepare the massive Boeing 777 before it flies to Barbados. Operational engineering manager Carl Trainer is on hand to keep an eye on the turnaround. Once the aircraft comes on stand, the engineers will check the oils of the engine, exactly like your car engine, exactly the same. But that oil is a bit more expensive than your car engine. The 777 is no bargain basement airline. At three times the size of a 737, it's the world's largest twin jet aeroplane and can't afford to hang around on the ground. Any delay in departure could cost up to £400 per minute. So any fault, like a blocked up toilet, must be urgently dealt with. The challenge is to avoid what could be a lengthy plumbing job. What we've got here is one of the lads have uh, designed uh, their own uh, uh, blockage adapter and were able to suck or blow. The blockage could be anything. It could be actually uh, tissue paper, nappies, uh, toothbrushes, even tea and coffee and orange. You get tea and coffee and orange that go down the wrong pipes. They congeal and it comes absolutely solid, like, like metal, it comes like metal. Beneath the 777, 400 litres of human waste is being pumped out of its toilets. A sometimes hazardous operation. The things that can go wrong mainly is if the connection, if that's not done properly, the pipe will fall down and all the debris will come on the ground, so it would be a disaster for us. If you've got wind as well, it can blow in your face. Fortunately, help is at hand. They've got towels and shampoo, although you don't need shampoo, yeah. but they've got no, towels no, and no. Uh, shampoo back at the... That's their... what happened with my hair, you know, the oh, shampoo. That's what happened, right, yeah, shampoo yeah. was yeah. acid. Hair yeah. and go, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they've got shampoo and towels back at the uh, back at the crew room. But having a shower just isn't enough. Because well, we've got so many injections that we have to take, yeah. so we're full of pinholes, unfortunately, <laughs> now. <laughs> Some occasions when these aircraft uh, come in, there might be a report that someone's put a passport or some drugs down one of the toilets before they've tried to get off, because obviously customs meet them at the door. And so what they uh, ask us to do is either uh, dump uh, the items, the toilets, into a, uh, a bucket or onto the floor itself. The toilet cart performs one of the most important yet unseen functions of the turnaround. You explain to people at home uh, what, 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 what the job is and well, what does that do? What does a water cart do? Well, it puts the water on your aircraft. How do you think the taps work? How do you think the toilets flush? And uh, people, well, I'll take it people when they get on board an aircraft, they don't, they don't think of that. It's, it's just there when they're on board. It's just like being at home, really. You flush the toilet, you know, it goes into the sewer. That's what these are, really. Sewers on wheels, to be honest with you. And then they have to take it away and, and, and dump it somewhere. Back on board, the suction device has unblocked the toilet. That's good. That's, that's good to go. That's good to go. Okay, okay thanks. A serious right, headache okay. has been avoided. The alternative would have meant a three-hour yeah, plumbing job on a two-and-a-half-hour turnaround. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you. Right. Meanwhile, another team of unseen workers are racing against the clock. When you come in, the job or well, the plane is a bit iffy. When we come off, it looks presentable. Working to a strict deadline, the cleaning crew are in charge of vacuuming, emptying litter, sterilising over 400 seat tables, replacing headrest covers, dressing the cabin, and of course, cleaning the all important toilets. On an average day, the team will work their sanitary magic on up to 20 planes. Well, some people find it difficult to find the toilet, and it goes everywhere. It's the mirrors that are hard to... <laughs> the, reason, uh, the reason the mirrors are hard to clean, especially down the back, I think quite a few people are joining the Three Mile High Club and you can see your hand marks on the, uh, on the mirrors, which is quite entertaining. 
<laughs> and they're difficult to clean sometimes, so <laughs> obviously that must have been quite exciting. <laughs> just put gloves on, deep breath, and just go on with it. It's approaching midday, and on board the British Airways 737 Oscar Charlie November, Captain Greg makes his final approach to Gatwick for the second time today. Have you suffered any diarrhea or any vomiting? At immigration, paramedic Chris Neal treats another passenger who's feeling faint. OK, if we can just have a finger. So it's just a small little scratch. In the terminals, queues are building as Head of Projects John Briley continues to monitor passenger flow. The short hauls have been out, they've deposited the passengers, picked up another load, come back again, and you can feel it in the air, it's tangible. The volume increases, the activity on the floor increases, the uncertainty increases, so this is the start of our second wave. You're in charge of you. See you, mate. Take care. For the first crew on board Oscar Charlie November, it's the end of their shift. Behind the scenes, senior managers gather for their daily meeting. The new owners have introduced a strong culture of accountability. Right, OK, it's almost 12.15, so we're getting it going. Um, it's a chance for management to baffle each other with airport jargon. We had um, a two peck faults on a couple of um, check-in desks that were compounding in baggage injection onto Line 7 that transposed down the line to Miss Salt on the VSU. Thank you very much. Translated, this means there's been a baggage delay. Over 123,000 bags have to be loaded on and off over 800 flights every day. It's a massive task. So you don't get blasted by the jets, and off we go. For baggage supervisor Gary Wolf, or Wolfie as he's known, it's a constant battle against the clock. Can't be a minute late, oh, I have to write a report out. So we really don't want delays. Not down to us anyway. Try to shove it onto someone else, you know, like the caterers or the refuelers. People want to leave on time, and quite rightly so, don't they? It's a bit of a fruit and veg job, this one. We've got tomatoes or something, you know. Must cost them a fortune to send these over. You know what I mean? Eight hour flight for a bunch of tomatoes. Whoa! Oh! Wolfie's been working as a baggage loader for 18 years. If I can get the whole once, there's money just everywhere. 20 pound notes, 5 pound notes, security bag had come undone. There's lots of things. You open it up, there's monkeys running around or there's dogs running around, you know. Second pallet. It's not just a case of getting bags and cargo on board. With the aid of a computer, loaders have to make sure that the plane is perfectly balanced for level flying. On a big set of scales, you know, you've just got to get it just right, you know. And the computer does it perfectly every time. Uh, hang on, hang on, wait, 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 oh, 05 first. This one. We try and get everybody's bag for their destination like good people we are. We do try to get all the bags. Because you know what it's like when you've got a flight and you didn't have yeah. your bag. It's horrible. Ruined your holidays, isn't it? Yeah. So we wouldn't want that to happen to anyone else. I think they think we just kick it around the place yeah. and then throw it on there if we want. Yeah, it's all the bad <laughs> press we get. But as you see, we take our pride in our job. We do, and if we see a bank that's fallen off the back, we'll go and pick it up and take it around. Yeah. In the airline business, time is money, and planes are only earning their keep when they're flying. It's ten past two in the afternoon and turnaround manager Chris Walker is preparing 737 Oscar Charlie November for its fifth flight of the day, this time to Rome. Just cleaning the, the captain's windows. Obviously, it's requesting to be done. That's done. Before every flight, pilots have to do a walk around. Captain Ian Walker is inspecting the outside of the plane to make sure that it's secure and there's no leaks or damage to the airframe. The brakes, landing gear and wing flaps are all controlled from a hydraulics bay located underneath the plane. It's a rarely seen underworld of pipes, pumps, plumbing and noise. Ah! 
just testing something on the flight then. Okay, that's good. Planes are rarely without a few niggles. And on board a Boeing 777, aircraft engineer Steve Bennett is investigating a mysterious puddle in the galley. Um, there is water there, which uh, has obviously come from somewhere. With complicated electronics just below the galley floor, engineer Carl Trainer climbs down into the plane's underworld to check for any leaks. Water and electricity in airplanes just don't mix. This main area is where all the computers are that run the aircraft and all the main wiring. There must be 50 or 60 computers in here. The complex electronics are just a few feet away from the outside world. In a nutshell, the aircraft is a, uh, just a big toilet roll. That's the actual skin of the toilet roll of the aircraft. As you can see, it's all rivets. It's just a few foul there of skin, and that's the outside of the aircraft. No leaks found. Up above, Steve suspects a blocked sink strainer is causing an overflow. Hopefully, we, uh, at least we'll do the job. John, could you be so kind as to pour some water down the sink, please? There's no leakage there, and I suspect that's where that was coming from. Good to go! <laughs> a delay has been avoided, but with passenger lives at stake, engineers can't be rushed. I have actually been pushed up against a, a bulkhead before now by a passenger and threatened. He said, why are we not going? And uh, my reply to him is, look, it's better we sort the problem out here on the ground than try and sort it out at 35,000 feet. <laughs> I said, because you don't want this problem at 35,000 feet. Uh, and he sort of, sort of stopped and had to think about it and uh, apologised and went back down and sat in his seat. Severe delays are also caused when passengers fail to turn up for their flight, but their bags have been loaded onto the plane. Which means we've got to get them all off and look for his bag. And we don't want that. And we don't want that. We don't want that. Although we're quite good at doing it, we don't want it. We don't want that. Because you have to go through each bag until you find the exact bag for that passenger, so we don't want All the stops up! But luckily everyone's here, it looks like. High noise levels mean the baggage handlers have to resort to their own form of semaphore. It's all hand signals, isn't it? Because you don't need to hear anything here. You've just got to be very visual. Because obviously you can't, you can't hear where I want them bins to go. Evolution, mate. Meanwhile, Chris is waiting to start boarding passengers onto Oscar Charlie November. So there's nowhere we're going to go in 15 minutes. A 15 minute delay is bad news for Chris. The problem is a missing baggage loader. And strict health and safety rules mean the flight can't depart. We're due off in three minutes and We've got 128 bags to load. We can't load the bags without a third man. We've got to have three men. Two in the hold and one putting the bags on. So I'm going to put... I'm going to put 15 minutes delay on the flight and then I'll take it from there. While Chris's plane is delayed, Wolfie's plane is running to schedule. Ten minutes early! Cock on! Oh, hasn't gone yet. Oh, we're, cold start, eh? we're ten minutes early. Most most flights are very tight turnarounds, so if you get a 25-minute delay, obviously uh, it's going to affect the next uh, departure at Gatwick. Two fifty-five p.m. Both flights are ready to go. Oscar Charlie November is 25 minutes late. Getting passengers away on time is a major operation, requiring thousands of people from different airlines and departments to work together. Just go down to the walk this funny way sign, and it's all there on your left hand side, all right? It doesn't actually say walk this funny way, by the way. Like a city that never stands still, Gatwick is constantly changing, 
expanding and improving. £40 million has been spent on a new high-tech security area, which has cut waiting times down to an average of five minutes. The less time passengers wait in 